They're the world's oldest existing secret society. The Freemasons. Throughout their long history, they've been suspected of plotting to take over the world, accused of fomenting bloody revolution in England, France, and America, reviled as devil worshippers, who stole the ancient treasure of King Solomon to fund their diabolical schemes. The Freemasons insist they're just a civic-minded fraternity, bound together by secret and elaborate, but ultimately harmless, rituals. What is the truth about the Freemasons? What are their secrets? And why, when it comes to the Freemasons, is fact often stranger than fiction? Behind every closed door lies a mystery. For the Freemasons, the hidden history begins inside a sacred temple, 1,000 years before Christ, with the shadowy figure at the heart of Freemasonry, Hiram Abiff, also known as the Widow's Son. There is no one version of the Hiram Abiff legend, just as there is no one version of, of, of any legend. According to the Freemasons, the widow's son of Hiram of Biff is the master builder of King Solomon's temple. The temple will house the stone tablets inscribed with the Ten Commandments and the holy presence of God himself. According to Freemason legend, Israel's King Solomon has received the design directly from God. Hiram, too, knows the secrets of the divine plan. In the story, Hiram Abiff is accosted by three junior workers who are jealous of the fact that they have not been uh, given all the secrets of masonry, and they try to extort them from Hiram Abiff. The workers believe that a single secret code word will give them Hiram's knowledge of God's divine plan, and with it, magical powers. Each one of the three assailants of Hiram is constantly asking for the secret word. And Hiram keeps telling them, you know, this is strange. Why are you asking for this? Every day at noon, Hiram leaves the worksite to pray. So the three workers lie in wait at the temple's three doors. As Hiram approaches the east door, the first man stops him and demands the secret. Hiram replies that when the temple is finished, he will be told the secret word. The word is given in recognition of accomplishment. When a mason has proved himself as an apprentice and as an expert craftsman, he's then recognized by being given the word of a master mason. Rebuked, the man slashes at Hiram's throat with a sharpened stone. Hiram escapes, but at the south door, the second man demands the secret. Again, the wounded Hiram refuses and is struck with a mason square. Hiram staggers to the west door. Again, the demand. Again, he refuses and is finally dealt the death blow. As he dies, he cries, who will help the widow's son? The phrase will become the Freemasons' universal cry for help from Brother Masons. Hiram Abiff's refusal to give up his secret knowledge to the undeserving makes him the greatest of Freemason heroes. Hiram Abiff represents the Freemason. That is, the builder who is free, who has a free mind, uh, you know, and that means freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of movement, you know, all these liberties that we cherish today. So you're a builder and a free one, and you're always, always under attack by three major enemies, ignorance, fanaticism, and tyranny. Outside the Bible, there is little evidence that either Hiram Abiff or Solomon's Temple ever existed. 
Yet today, each of the 15,000 Masonic lodges around the world is designed after the biblical description of Solomon's temple. The Masons wear ritual costumes that have symbolic ties to the temple. And within their lodge's secret most chamber, they reenact the ritual murder of Hiram Abiff. What you're seeing is a recreation of the initiation rite of a master mason. The exact contents of the ceremony remain a secret, but the History Channel was able to create this scene with the help of present and former Freemasons. When I joined, the rituals were just as bad as crazy as I thought they would be. I asked everybody what they meant, and the answer was, well, you'll find out, don't worry. And over the next two, three years, it became evident that they hadn't a clue. Nobody knows what those rituals are about. So it started me in my quest to try and understand them uh, further. To have my body, have cut, my in body two, cut in two, my bowels my removed bowels and burned. The candidate swears a solemn oath never to reveal what transpires in this room on pain of death. Then, playing the role of Hiram, he is struck with three ritualized blows and simulates death. It is an allegorical story of fidelity, of integrity, of keeping your word and your bond. Two times, other Masons try to revive him, but in vain. The third time, they succeed, and the candidate rises, reborn as a master Mason. It is to teach the Mason the importance of the immortality of the soul. And in so doing, a Mason should not only strive to develop himself physically and intellectually, but also spiritually and esoterically. It is about death and resurrection, which is at the heart of the concept of Freemasonry. Each Freemason is physically resurrected from a symbolic death. It's all allegorical. And this is, this is what people will never understand. It is really an individual secret. There is no secret for the fraternity and for Freemasonry. It is an individual secret that is hidden inside each and every Mason. And that is of great importance to the Mason, whether it's a he or she, and I mention she, by the way, because although in Europe there are many more fem uh, female Masons, uh, women Masons, in the United States they have more of an of a, um, auxiliary body. However, feminine Freemasonry has already been introduced to the United States by the Europeans. Today, close to three million Freemasons are spread all over the world, forming the world's oldest existing secret society. Many are educated men, civic leaders, movers and shakers in their communities. Some of the world's most powerful men have been members. Winston Churchill, Henry Ford, Duke Ellington, the philosopher Voltaire, and Mozart, all were Freemasons, and in America, nine signers of the Declaration of Independence, George Washington, and 13 other U.S. presidents have been Freemasons. That concentration of power within a secret society has led to the most sinister of conspiracy theories. Right from the beginning, right from the time Freemasonry becomes your fraternity, there's nervousness about an order which is not only secret, but talks about being secret. Are these guys taking over the country? Do they have their own secret plot or something? There are many anti-Masonic conspiracy theories that we are the secret controllers of government and industry worldwide. There's also a theory out there that the secret inner circle of Freemasonry worships Satan. Didn't you know that it was a Jewish Masonic imperialist conspiracy that killed Lady Di? You find that on the internet. When you tell them that it just doesn't happen, they, they just simply say, well, you don't know yet, you're not high enough. I guess the best case you could make that the Masons are dangerous and sinister is that we've been around for centuries, located everywhere, that men of power and import have belonged to us, and we meet privately. However, I'd like to add, if we can't agree on whether to serve ham sandwiches or, or, or tuna sandwiches after the meeting, how can we possibly agree to take over the world? 
And yet the Freemasons have been the focus of fear and mystery right from their beginnings centuries ago. When Europe was plunged into the Dark Ages, and those few Freemasons who retained their secret skills built the great cathedrals, laying the groundwork for the secret society. One of the keys to the Freemason secret society lies buried in the saga of the first Freemasons, the great cathedral builders of Northern Europe. In the Middle Ages, these illiterate working men possessed the astonishing ability to transform raw stone into shimmering godly palaces. I think that building stone has always been considered to be something akin to God. Major buildings tended to be temples and cathedrals, and the skills and knowledge to build them stemmed from geometry, which itself stemmed from astronomy. And astronomy was the heavens where the stars are, where the gods or God is. And there was this thread of godliness. Their almost magical skills earned the stonemasons a special place in medieval Europe. They were free to travel across any border to wherever the work took them. For this rare privilege of freedom of movement, they were known as free stone masons. When a newcomer arrived at a work site, he faced a test. To prove his standing, he approached the master and shook his hand. Each of the three levels of skill, apprentice, journeyman, and master, had its own secret grip. The Freemason Secret Society would adopt the stonemason's handshakes as their own. A 19th century book claims to reveal the secret handshakes. The grip of the entered apprentice is made by pressing the thumb against the top of the first knuckle joint. The grip of the fellow craft is taken as in an ordinary handshake, and the mason presses the top of his thumb of against the space mason between firmly the first grasps and the right hand of the fellow mason. The thumbs of both hands are interlaced. This grip is also called the strong grip, or the lion's paw. The handshakes were created in the stonemason's guilds the medieval precursor of the trade union. Inside the guild, the culture was democratic. Every mason, from the richest master to the lowliest apprentice, addressed the other as brother. The tradition of equality is represented among modern Freemasons by the medieval stonemason symbol of the level. The level is to remind the mason that there are people of different cultures, different backgrounds, different professions. Yet in the lodge, we all meet on the level. That's where it comes from in the English language, being on the level or level with me. It comes from the Masonic teaching. You end up on the level, and it doesn't matter how great you are or how insignificant you are. Everyone is going to the same place. You're, you're going to the grave. The simple tools of the medieval stonemasons gave them a power beyond even their own understanding. The stone frame for this window at Jedburgh Abbey in Scotland was built without formula or equations, designed with a few turns of the master mason's compass. The stonemasons favored particular proportions, such as the ratio we now understand as 1.414 to 1. That's the ratio of the length of Jedburgh Abbey to the length of its nave. This ratio wasn't just considered pleasing to the eye. 
It was held as sacred, creating a mystical connection with the power of God. Geometry was often seen as more than a branch of mathematics. It was the all-powerful road to the divine. Today, the stonemason's combination of math and mysticism lives on in the secret society of Freemasons. I think at the heart of Freemasonry is this f unstable mixture of, of two different views of the world. On one hand, you have the view that the world is complicated, it's mysterious, that people in the past knew things that we didn't know today. On the other hand, you have another view of the world, that it's simple, that it's based upon rules, and it's essentially mathematical. And what Freemasonry does is it takes these two views, which have now in our culture become separated, and it keeps them together. The medieval stonemason's mix of scientific skill, mystical thinking, and democratic freedoms would prove irresistible to a radical new brand of thinker emerging in Europe, the scientists and philosophers of the Enlightenment. In the 18th century, these high-born gentlemen would take over the free stonemason's guild and with it, create a force that would change the world. The secret society of Freemasons was born out of the Stonemasons Guild sometime in the 1600s. The exact details of this strange transformation remain a mystery. We know that in 1599, when we have the oldest extant minutes of a lodge in Scotland, that they are very definitely meeting as a labor union. And we know in 1717, when the four old lodges come together in London, they're now gentlemen's clubs. So during the 1600s, something happened. What happened was the enormous upheaval in political and intellectual life known as the Enlightenment. In Britain, men like Isaac Newton turned away from church dogma and towards science and reason as ways to understand the world. Freemasonry is rooted in this period when science is becoming the center of learned culture. The center of science in this period is the Royal Society. And by the early 18th century, is being headed by Sir Isaac Newton. They were intending to create a new belief system, a new cosmology, a new way of looking at the world, more fitting with their own experience. Using only mathematics and observation, Newton constructed a system of rational laws that explained the workings of the natural world without need of God's direct intervention. But for Newton, the laws of gravity and motion did not explain everything. Newton and Freemasonry share things, not only of a view of the world, which is mathematical, which is scientific, but also an interest in the ancient world and the mystical origins of humanity. Newton the scientist was also a devoted alchemist in search of a chemical process to create the Philosopher's Stone, a magical substance that would cure disease, heal the soul, extend life, and turn base metals into gold. He grew obsessed with the biblical description of Solomon's temple, believing that its design must hold ancient wisdom and perhaps the secret recipe for the Philosopher's Stone. Whilst a lot of this is theological and fanciful, in my view, a lot of it is science too, very ancient science. So there is a period in ancient history where the two became mixed together. Uh, where science and theology uh, were two halves of the same thing. Newton drew up detailed diagrams of Solomon's temple, reconstructed its geometry, made predictions of the future by interpreting its dimensions, but failed to discover the Philosopher's Stone. Enlightenment ideas had a profound effect on politics as well. Parliament executed Charles I in 1649 for tyranny, set up a short-lived republic, and eventually 
a limited monarchy. King Louis XIV and the rest of Europe's absolute monarchs faced a direct challenge. Throughout Europe, police suppressed Enlightenment views, and the church turned its attention to this new and powerful threat. If you were a person of science, if you were a person who favored liberal, humanistic, tolerance, uh, separation of church and state, you ran the risk of being on the other side of a political or religious inquisition. We must remember that in the medieval times, people didn't even own their bodies. If the church wanted to torture them, the inquisition for some reason, that was sort of okay because they didn't own their bodies. To avoid persecution, the modern-minded men hunted for safe places to meet, and some found the Stonemasons Guild, whose democratic values and practices seemed to embody Enlightenment ideals to an astonishing degree. For the Stonemasons, these new gentlemen masons provided a new respectability. If you think about the 18th century Freemason lodges as sort of revolutionary coffee houses, the ideas that are developing here are tolerance, brotherhood, egalitarianism. These are ideas that are new ideas in that time period. Over time, the gentlemen displaced the workers, and in January 1717, at a pub in London, Isaac Newton's friend Jean de Salier founded the first Freemason Grand Lodge, named for the covered shed at every medieval construction site where the stonemasons ate and drank. The Freemasons' basic charter made religious tolerance its first rule, a radical idea at the time. Masons elected their leaders democratically, a notion that would soon have sweeping impact. The Masons embellished the legend of Hiram Abiff, the free builder, and created an extensive language of symbols aimed at developing moral character and improving society. There are so many symbols in Freemasonry that it's difficult to say which are the most important. The square reminds me to square my actions by the square of virtue. The compasses tells me that I should circumscribe my passions. The letter G stands for geometry, which was in the center of the Mason's life, or God, who is in the center of the Freemason's life. The letter G refers to the supreme being, uh, the grand architect of the universe. And we use that term to emphasize uh, freedom of religion because people can define that supreme being any way they want. The Catholic Church condemned Freemasonry almost as soon as it began. In 1738, Pope Clement XII issued the first of what would become over the centuries a torrent of papal bulls attacking the Freemasons. The secret societies called the Freemasons are depraved and perverted. They pose a great danger to the souls of the faith. Therefore do we command most strictly that no Catholic shall dare to enter, propagate, or support these Freemasons under pain of excommunication. The church tried everything in its power to halt this force, which we almost can't imagine today the power of that political force. It, it caught like a wildfire because it represented a new way of thinking about the world that was the wave of the future. Soon, democratic revolutions would wipe the old order away. And the secret society of Freemasons would be at the heart of it all. Benjamin Franklin was at the center of the diplomatic movement of the American Revolution. He belongs to a Masonic lodge in France, to the Lodge of the Nine Sisters. In fact, Benjamin Franklin escorts Voltaire, the greatest Enlightenment figure of France. He escorts him into the lodge at a special meeting. So here you have the two of the key figures of the Enlightenment, and where do they meet? In the Masonic Lodge.
The accepted history of the Freemasons links the secret society back to medieval stonemasons. But a deep tradition holds that the true roots of the society trace back to a 3,000-year-old history tied to the legendary White Knights of the Crusades, the Knights Templar. The structure that I see is that the rituals used by Freemasons today came from the Knights Templar. And the Knights Templar got them from uh, the priests of Jerusalem at the time of Christ. Like the Freemasons, the Knights Templar have been a source of fascination and mystery for centuries. As the Pope's special soldiers of Christ, they killed countless thousands of infidels, mostly Muslims, during the Crusades, and grew to great wealth and power in medieval Europe. But they began with a solitary group of nine Frenchmen who traveled to the Holy Land in the year 1118, ostensibly to protect Christian pilgrims. Once in Jerusalem, they were housed at Al-Aqsa Mosque, ground zero for the Freemasons. Al-Aqsa was built directly on top of the ruins of the Jewish temples that preceded it, including, according to tradition, the central icon in all of Freemasonry, the Temple of Solomon. It was known in medieval times that the Templars housed their horses in underneath the southeastern platform in the area called Solomon's Stables. So the Templars were involved in cleaning out this area, and that was an extensive job. On this much, historians agree. But since the Middle Ages, rumors and legends have held that the Templars chose their dirty stables to dig for buried treasure. Solomon's gold, the plunder of ancient Rome, the Holy Grail, and perhaps the lost secrets of the ancient Jewish sect called the Essenes, whose strange rituals told the secret of how man might communicate with God directly, as King Solomon had. For author and Freemason Christopher Knight, these Essene documents, written by the authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls, were the real treasure. They lived on charity, they had no income and they just worked night and day digging. They found their documents over those nine years um, and their treasures, and within months they were fabulously rich. Treasure hunters or not, the Templars returned to Europe in 1127 and quickly gained the sponsorship of the church. Their group soon expanded in number to include 1,200 knights and more than 20,000 retainers. They diversified their services inventing early forms of banking, shipping, and security. Within a generation, they were a powerful international force. The Knights Templar were really the first multinational banking concern and multinational corporation of sorts. Strangely, the Templar rules stipulated that their meetings could take place only at night. Perhaps similar to a board meeting today, you know, the outsiders were not allowed, so that opened up questions about what was really happening. And within just a handful of years, rumors were spreading that they were conducting strange rituals, which were apparently not Christian. These rituals, argues Christopher Knight, must have come to the Templars from the scrolls they discovered under the temple. Rituals that served as the basis for the rebirth of an ancient religious practice that bonded the Templars together in strength and in secrecy, a bond soon to be shared with the Freemasons. The Templars embarked on a massive building program, employing free stone masons to build the great cathedrals at Chartres, Notre Dame, and many others across Europe. The Templar families had to bring in stone masons and turn these people into perhaps like something like lower level Templars. They had to give them a ritual, uh, so they were bound to secrecy also. Christopher Knight believes the Templars' powerful rituals live on in the Freemason rituals of today, but that the meaning has been lost. There is one very good reason why Freemasonry created this aura of secrecy. That is because of the rituals they conduct. 
they don't know why they conduct them. So if you're open with somebody and say, well, yes, I went to this ritual and I had one trouser leg rolled up and I had my, my, my chest out of here and I was blindfolded in a noose around my neck and a knife to my chest and, oh, right, yeah, that's pretty weird. Why did you do that? I don't know. Well, you're going to sound a fool. So you pretend it's secret. In medieval Europe, the Templar's power would not last. In 1307, the king of France, plotting to seize the Templar fortune, sent out orders to strike down the Templars in a single day. It was early in the morning, at dawn, that the frightening knock on the door came. Suddenly, the stampede began. The initial shock became, um, a, a shock wave across all of Europe. It's like every single company director of every corporation or government had been rounded up at dawn. It happened on Friday the 13th, 1307. Some folklorists today believe that the Friday the 13th superstition may originate from the Templar arrest. This order has aroused my anger and wrath because of the evil of its sons. They fell into the unforgivable sin of Pope Clement V, an ally of the king, condemned the Knights Templar. They were charged with blasphemy, heresy, spitting on the cross. They were accused possibly of worshiping a cat or a severed head, and, um, something called, allegedly called Baphomet. The exact meaning of the Baphomet idol remains a mystery. The word may refer to Muhammad, or to the Greek words Baphi and Metis, the baptism of wisdom. Through the centuries, Baphomet has become a powerful figure in satanic and occult practice. The most terrible thing they could be accused of really was denying the divinity of Christ and the power of the cross. They never sought to deny that. And they were tortured pretty horribly. In 1312, after five years of trials and bloody executions, the Pope disbanded the Knights Templar by decree. The order slipped into history, or did it? Not all of the Templars were rounded up, or perhaps could have been, because there were so many thousands of them. The Templars went underground all over Europe, and they did, as a matter of fact, create other offshoot secret societies and tried to keep some of their traditions alive. Some say that some of them went and infiltrated the Mason guilds so they could travel freely. For Christopher Knight, the place the Knights Templar brought their secret knowledge and their sacred scrolls was Rosslyn Chapel in the Scottish Lowlands. Masonic ritual describes how King Solomon met with his leading priests in a chamber underneath King Solomon's temple. Now, Rosslyn has exactly that, and Masonic ritual describes exactly that. Can't be coincidence. The mysterious Rosslyn Chapel just outside of Edinburgh is the centerpiece of a controversial theory that sees the Freemasons as the modern-day descendants of the medieval Knights Templar and of an ancient religious sect. Rosalind is hugely important. It's a key to understanding Masonic ritual. The Masonic rituals that we use today, the, the, certainly the important ones, and Rosalind Chapel are two halves of the same thing. One unlocks the other. Rosalind is covered with intricate carvings and sculpture, imagery so plentiful and often so obscure that the exact purpose of the chapel has long been the subject of speculation. Rosslyn was the personal project of William St. Clair, a 15th century nobleman, the official patron of the local stonemasons guild. And according to the inscription added to his tomb long after his death, 
a Knight Templar, a hotly disputed claim. We have no documentable evidence William St. Clair was ever a Knight Templar. The suppression of the Templar Order was in 1312, but Roslyn wasn't started until 1446, well beyond that time frame. Did the Templars build Roslyn Chapel? The answer is a definitive no. But the Templars did have a fortress near Roslyn, and the Templars did try to survive as a secret society. In search of Templar connections, thousands now flock to Roslyn every year, thanks to the chapel's featured role in the best-selling novel, The Da Vinci Code. The staff is more than willing to point to any possible Templar connection. One of the most intriguing ones, perhaps, is just behind me on the window here, the image of the Knight Templar on a horse and behind him a passenger. It's indicative of the Knight Templars in as much as they invariably had somebody on the horse behind them. It was kind of their, like being a boy scout, really. You always had a buddy to look after. With the spear and the cross on the back, that's very much a Templar image. Christopher Knight argues that the entire chapel was meant to be a recreation of Solomon's Temple, a signal to underground Knights Templar across the world that their ancient cult would rise again. He points to the half-built west wall of the chapel, a copy, he believes, of Jerusalem's Wailing Wall, and to the overall design, which Knight believes was based on the structure that rose to replace the Temple of Solomon. Herod's Temple. Roslyn Chapel is a one-third scale uh, copy of um, the Herodian Temple. When you marry together the foundations of Roslyn and overlay them with the Herodian Temple in Jerusalem, they are the same, they're perfect. It is an exact copy. The Freemason connection to Roslyn begins with Solomon's Temple, site of the central Freemason legend of Hiram Abiff, the master murdered by jealous apprentices. At Roslyn, a corresponding myth centers on the spectacular and strange apprentice pillar. Um, it's, it's thought that William Sinclair had been to Rome and seen a pillar which he just thought was so exquisite he wanted to have replicated in his chapel. So he went to his master mason and said, I've seen a pillar and I would like you to build it for me. Master Mason felt it was such a responsibility that he had to go to Rome to see the original before he could build it. And during that time, one of the apprentices had a dream. And in this dream, he was told how to build the pillar. And he also saw himself completing it. And William Sinclair, fearing that his Master Mason may never return from Rome, authorized the apprentice to do it. And this is what he produced. the master mason did return. And on his arrival, when he saw the beautiful pillar, clearly enraged with envy, he gave him a smash across the forehead with a mallet, killing him instantly. So the apprentice dies from just the kind of blow that killed Hiram Abiff. All of the other apprentices then turned on the master mason and killed him on the spot. So the other apprentices decided that this story shouldn't be forgotten. So they carved faces from the story on the interior of the chapel. That's actually the face of the apprentice. You can see that there is actually a big gash on the upper right-hand side of his forehead where the fatal mallet struck. And directly opposite, worn smooth by age, is the face of the master mason who, rather ironically, will be forced forever to look diagonally across the chapel at the apprentice pillar. And other carvings may refer to the Freemasons. The unusual postures of these figures match exactly the curled position of a candidate in a Freemason initiation ritual. And there is more. Perhaps the most single important item is a little carving that stands about that high. Um, which shows a candidate being initiated, um, one would say, into Freemasonry. Um, because this is long before Freemasonry. There's a noose around the person's neck, which is part of the requirement for a, the first degree in Freemasonry. And it's been held by someone who appears to be a Templar, with the Templar cross on his chest and the beard. And the points of 
convergence between the modern ritual of the first degree and this are so many that statistically it's impossible for it not to be directly connected in some way. Mainstream scholars dismiss Knight's theory. Rosslyn, they say, is an amalgam of Christian, Celtic, and other folklore-based legends. William St. Clair's attempt to preserve a threatened cultural heritage. Sir William foresaw the possible danger that certain belief systems or thoughts or images that had been previously burned in many inquisitional book burnings through the Middle Ages might not get preserved for posterity. So Rosalind is a Bible or a book in stone. These carvings present perhaps the greatest Rosalind mystery. They are identified as maize, corn, found only in the New World, carved 50 years before Columbus set sail. A 500-year-old legend has it that William St. Clair's grandfather, Sir Henry, was a Knight Templar who led an expedition to the New World and brought back corn, which his grandson celebrated in these carvings. We asked a botanist from the university to give us his opinion of this, and when he looked at them, he wasn't convinced until he found one more plant in Roslyn Chapel, a small plant, and he said, if you've got that one, then I'm prepared to believe that the other ones are genuine because this plant would only have been found in the New World. The plant's name is the prairie trefoil. The evidence for the Templar presence in America is circumstantial at best, and at present dismissed by mainstream scholars. I personally think that while the evidence is, is very romantic and makes a great tale, that there's nothing there that supports it factually. A wonderful legend and, and a wonderful myth, and I put it in the camp of sort of Greek myths. Great story, great narrative, uh, highly unlikely. But the vision of Knights Templar in America, turned to Freemasons in America, persists. I think it's reasonable to suggest that the United States of America is, in part at least, the, the triumph of Freemasonry. The ideals of equality and openness of thinking that were inside this early Jewish priesthood, they used those Masonic ideals to create this new utopia where everybody would be free, the land of the free. Freemasons Ben Franklin, George Washington, Paul Revere and others would all play crucial Agreed. roles in the American Revolution. In Congress, July 4th, 1776. So crucial that they would give rise to the suspicion that America itself was a secret Masonic project. Washington, D.C., one of the most photographed cities in the world. Its monuments are powerful and familiar, its history well known. Or is it? In recent years, a gathering storm of suspicions has brought renewed interest in an old idea, that the United States is somehow under the control of a powerful secret society, an innocent-seeming worldwide civic organization with nearly two million members in the United States, the Freemasons and that Washington, D.C. is ground zero for that conspiracy. We know that Dan Brown, the author of The Da Vinci Code, intends to set his sequel to The Da Vinci Code against the backdrop of Freemasonry and some of these interesting histories and mysteries that go back to the founding of America. The symbols that reveal the Freemasons' presence, whisper the rumors, are all around us, hidden in plain sight. Some are obvious, like the compass and square, a public sign found on every Freemason lodge. The G in the center refers, the Freemasons say, to God, the grand architect of the universe. Other Freemason symbols are more subtle. Even on the dollar bill, the theories allege, are secret codes understood by Freemasons everywhere to mean that the plot to take over America is going well. 
Scholars find the idea ludicrous. They build this conspiracy theory and they weave it together until it's a huge giant thing. The Masons are just an element of it because it includes the CIA, the KGB, the PTA and every other alphabet thing. Of course they include the Masons because the Masons have secrets. Anti-Masons talk a lot about the Masons trying to take over the world, the new world order, you know. Do they really think that people like George Washington, like Benjamin Franklin, were engaged in a conspiracy to take over the world? The truth about the Freemasons in America may be even stranger than the conspiracy theories. The story begins in England, in the days of the founding Freemason fathers. No one knows exactly how it happened, but the medieval Free Stone Masons Guild was transformed in the 1700s by politically minded noblemen into an entirely separate organization. These new Freemasons wanted a secret club to advance their own blend of Enlightenment ideals, science, reason, equality, and freedom of thought. I think it's important to see Freemasonry as a repository of intellectual knowledge, scientific knowledge, that by definition had to develop as a secret society because of the hegemony of the church in earlier times. In the late 1730s, the Pope issues a papal bull stating that Roman Catholics cannot join the fraternity because Freemasonry at its heart is about breaking down religious barriers. It's bringing together people of different religious origins. And for people who believe that the, the church is the center of things and that other organizations dilute it, Freemasonry is a frightening kind of thing. It caught like a wildfire because it represented a new way of thinking about the world that was the wave of the future. Great thinkers like Voltaire in France, people like Mozart composing the magic flute, which is a Masonic allegory. Adam Smith, uh, David Hume, people we associate with the ideas that then led to the American Revolution. Benjamin Franklin was one of the first Americans to join the secret society. He underwent the bizarre ritual of the Freemason initiation ceremony in Philadelphia in 1731. These rituals used by Freemasons are undoubtedly of ancient Jewish origin, very old Jewish origin, going back to the time of Solomon, 3,000 years probably. It is about death and resurrection, which is at the heart of the concept of Freemasonry. Each Freemason is physically resurrected from a symbolic death. The Freemasons' secrecy and acceptance of men of different religious groups made them targets of suspicion. In the 1730s in America, there's a good deal of talk, what is masonry secret? It mattered if you were a Presbyterian or if you were a Baptist. So, so masonry, in blurring those kind of lines, seems to many people to be upending some of the, some of the foundations of society. Freemasonry spread throughout the colonies. By the 1770s, revolution was in the air, with American Freemasons like Paul Revere taking the lead. The Boston Tea Party is one point at which you can see Freemasons actually um, being closely involved with one of the central events of the American Revolution. Because we know the Green Dragon Tavern in Boston, the meeting place of one of the key groups of Masons. This is the center of a lot of the meetings about the Tea Party. In fact, there's a drawing of the Green Dragon Tavern from this period that actually somebody has written on there. This is where we planned what becomes the Boston Tea Party. Paul Revere, John Hancock, and Joseph Warren are all members of the Lodge. Okay, we're talking about firebrand liberals. This Lodge doesn't meet that night. It's actually written in the minutes that we were involved with the tea. One cannot truly understand how the American experiment came to be, how the ideals of the American Revolution flourished without studying the role of Freemasonry. Masons are dangerous. A Mason learns that he or she has a free will. A Mason is very dangerous when it comes to systems of government that try to oppress the free mind of an individual. 
With the Mason-influenced revolution underway and the new nation defining itself, Freemason Ben Franklin suggested an important change to Thomas Jefferson's draft of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. The word sacred bothered Franklin, by now the grand master of the Pennsylvania Freemasons. Better still. A Freemason's America, in accordance with advanced enlightenment ideas, would be bound by reason, not by faith. Franklin found a more acceptable word, self-evident. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. The Declaration of Independence is part of the same intellectual world as early Freemasonry. It's a world where God still exists, but you don't emphasize the specific things that divide you about religion. These individuals were not primarily Christians in their belief system. They saw themselves as Christians in a very broadly defined light. They talked about divine providence. They didn't talk about God. They talked about uh, belief in man and the importance of doing good works on, in this life, on this earth. They talked about tolerance, progress, the need for men to band together to change society. Of the 56 men to sign the Declaration of Independence, nine were openly Freemasons, including the presiding officer, John Hancock. But America's most important founding Freemason was none other than George Washington. So the fact that Washington is a Freemason is of enormous significance. George Washington joined, even when he was just 20 years old, so anxious was he to join the fraternity. With the War for Independence underway, General Washington struggled to transform the ragtag Continental Army into a unified fighting force. Freemason lodges set up inside army camps provided a place for discussion and the roots of the first truly American identity. You found that religious organizations were largely segregated by colony with Calvinists to the north, Quakers in, in the middle, Anglicans to the south. Uh, but Freemasonry was a group that uh, transcended the boundaries. It provides a common bond of friendship that is so essential in maintaining esprit de corps. About 40% of all the officers belonged to the fraternity and quite often met within lodges that were held in the army camps. But the war did not begin well for the Americans. Washington knew that without more supplies and better officers, the revolution was doomed. Washington's Freemason brother, Ben Franklin, took care of that problem, persuading the King of France to enter the war on America's side. Franklin was an ambassador to Paris, to France, and, and you hear, of course, in Tech well, he used his connections in France. What were those connections? He was a Freemason. He was very active in Freemasonry. In fact, Benjamin Franklin guided Voltaire in his initiation in the Lodge of the Nine Muses in Paris. I mean, he was so well connected. He used the Masonic network to recruit great generals and officers from around Europe who were willing to come serve under another Mason, George Washington, fight for the ideals of the American Revolution because those were also Masonic ideals. Help came from German Baron von Steuben, a Freemason who guided Washington's troops through the hardships of Valley Forge, and the Marquis de Lafayette, a Freemason who helped lead America to the ultimate victory over the British at Yorktown. Without the Freemason leadership, the revolution might never have been won. With Washington there and with so many other figures, by the time the revolution is over, most Americans have come to see Masonry as a peculiarly patriotic, nationalistic organization. America was free. When Washington swore his oath of office in 1789 on a Bible borrowed from a Masonic lodge held by a fellow Mason, the fraternity had a unique opportunity to help shape their new nation. And they took it.
As Americans learn about Freemason history and the founding of this country, they will find some of the episodes to be shocking, strange, bizarre. In the first days of the Republic, President George Washington, a Freemason worshipful master, took a strong hand in designing the capital city that would bear his name. George Washington, he's intimately involved with his creation, the creation of this new capital city right near his home. In the summer of 1791, the president hired a Revolutionary War veteran, Major Pierre Charles L'Enfant, to work on the design of the city. L'Enfant's plan would reflect Washington's deepest beliefs, starting with the Freemason president's insistence that the district be set on an exact 10-mile square. The city was designed scientifically and geometrically. Why? To send a very important message that unlike the old order, where the reliance was on religion mainly to govern the affairs of the people, under the new order, the reliance is going to be mainly on reason, the scientific method, geometry, to govern the affairs of the people. Many hands would get involved. Thomas Jefferson drew the initial street plan, an uncompromising grid. L'Enfant added the distinctive radial streets, shooting off at angles from focal points like the Capitol. Andrew Ellicott, Benjamin Banneker, and others would all contribute, none known to be Freemasons, but to many members of the fraternity, the result reflects a uniquely Freemason vision of America. It reflects ideals of architecture and masonry espoused by the fraternity. You can see the various uh, symbols of geometry that we use in Freemasonry. The triangle, the concept of the three, the square, the concept of the four. The Freemasons used countless shapes and symbols to educate initiates in the ways of what was called the craft. The Masons in the 1700s understood the power of symbols to communicate deep psychological ideas, complex political ideas. They're almost Zen-like in how simple they appear and yet how profound they might be. Some of them, even the scholars and experts, haven't decoded. The most well-known Freemason symbol is the sign of the linked compass and square. These simple tools of the medieval stonemasons remind the Freemason to deal honestly, on the square, and to live a measured and moral life. Freemason Akram Elias sees the compass and square as part of the capital's Masonic design. The coded symbols built into the city began with Washington, he believes, but their development has continued through the centuries. The top of the compass is the capital. One axis of the compass goes to the White House, the other one is from the Capitol to the Jefferson Memorial. And then the square is from the Lincoln Memorial to the White House, Lincoln to Jefferson. For this square and compass to be completed, the Jefferson Memorial needed to be where it is today. And you know, that part of the river was landfilled for about six years, from 1933 to 39, under Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Oops, happened to be a mason, by the way. But I don't know. It's probably coincidence. Of course it's coincidence. Not even all Masons agree. Now, Akram and I do not see eye to eye, and he's going to give you this lengthy explanation of how Washington was moved by his Masonic ideals to incorporate the 10-mile square as a symbol of the perfection of the city, the perfection of uh, the, the, the United States government, uh, all based upon Masonic ideals. If you take any rectangular grid pattern, you superimpose on it a radial design, you cannot avoid creating something that will look like a square and compasses. And so, no, I don't see them there at all. It's like an etch-a-sketch. You start to trace things. If you go really far out, you're going to see any conceivable Masonic symbol is there somewhere. I can look at the streets of Washington and also find a piggy and a horsey. Uh, I don't think they're there. Lower the stone! Imbued with a Freemason code or not, the nation celebrated the founding of its new capital with great patriotic fervor, and Freemasons played the central role. In 1793, 
the Freemasons were asked to lay the cornerstone of the United States Capitol. Washington himself, dressed in his full Masonic regalia, performs a Masonic ritual, which includes libations of corn, wine, and oil. Now, maize is a symbol of abundance, of prosperity. Oil is a symbol of peace, and wine is a symbol of happiness. Thomas Jefferson talks about the capital as being a, a temple, the first temple dedicated to the sovereignty of the people. They're acting in some ways as sort of priests of this new nation. They are taking on a sacred function. The president's public embrace of Freemasonry set the fraternity on an uninterrupted course toward power and influence. But that power would suddenly collapse in 1826 with a charge of murder. With George Washington as president and Freemason, the secret society grew more public, gaining membership, power, and influence throughout the young United States. Freemasonry became very popular, and as a result of that, some people started questioning, said, what is happening here? It seems like everywhere you turn, you find a Mason. Are these guys taking over the country? Are they, do they have their own secret plot or something? The Freemasons were soon the center of America's first conspiracy theory. It began in France, where the French Revolution turned into Robespierre's reign of terror. Thousands were sent to the guillotine in the name of liberty. In 1798, in America, a shocking book appeared that claimed the French Revolution and the terror that followed were really the work of a small devil-worshipping society that hid under the cover of the Society of Freemasons, the Illuminati. The Illuminati, fascinating, powerful connotative reference, cultish, secret, symbolic rituals. The Illuminati was a real historical movement created interestingly in the year 1776 in Bavaria, and they did attempt to foment revolutions, and they did spread in secret to some other European countries. A number of people begin to raise fears that the Illuminati have come to America, that they're also trying to create that same sort of thing. George Washington was both president and the country's most famous Freemason. If the country believed the Freemasons were corrupt, the government might collapse. George Washington receives letters from important people in American society asking him to declare that he is not a Freemason. And George Washington replies, sort of, I'm not now and never have been a member of the Illuminati. And he doesn't denounce Freemasonry. The Freemason-Illuminati conspiracy theory was based on bad facts. The historical record shows that the Illuminati existed as a group for less than 10 years. The Illuminati were abolished in 1785 with public trials and banishments. But the Freemasons would never completely escape from the shadow of the Illuminati. Against a growing tide of suspicion, by the 1820s, Freemasons were in power all over the country, in small towns, in state houses, and with the election of Freemason James Monroe in the White House as well. But the Masons' position of power and influence was about to end with a crime and a cover-up. Initiation rituals are at the core of Freemasonry. These strange ceremonies draw on traditions thousands of years old. Every Freemason experiences them and swears an oath, promising death to anyone who reveals their secrets. In 1826, William Morgan violated that oath. An ex-Freemason in the western New York State town of Batavia, Morgan announced plans to publish a book exposing every detail of even the highest, most secret Freemason rituals. Soon after, the heavy drinking Morgan was jailed on the trivial charge of defaulting on a $2.60 debt. For many Masons, these were the culmination, the most sacred moments within fraternal activity. 
the Masons in the area around him. They do all sorts of things to try to stop him from trying to speak to him, to try to burn down the printing press. And eventually they turn to kidnapping. They take him out of the prison and they ride with him off into the night. Morgan's never seen again. As the carriage pulled away, a witness heard Morgan cry out, murder, murder. Many people think he was killed, which is my view. Some people say he was sent to Canada, sent elsewhere. Four men, all local Masons, were arrested and charged with kidnapping. As the wheels of justice turn, they don't turn very well because Masons seem to be trying to cover this up. You have, you have Masonic sheriffs packing juries. You have Masonic organizations seeming to try to remove witnesses from the area. When the defendants were let off with light sentences, a public outcry erupted. Even DeWitt Clinton, the powerful governor of New York State and Freemason, was suspected of conspiracy. Public opinion uh, convicted the Masons, all the Masons, not just a group of renegade, out-of-control local Masons, but every Mason everywhere was guilty of the murder. Americans come to see Masonry in a new way. What had seemed to be the embodiment of everything that was right about America now seems to be the embodiment of everything that's wrong about America. Freemasonry seems to be an emblem of the compromises, of the failures of this world, a world which claimed to be equal, but yet was deeply stratified, deeply divided. So Masons claimed to be about equality, but yet had kings, had high priests, had worshipful masters in their lodges. By the time of the presidential campaign of 1831, a burgeoning anti-Mason movement had coalesced into a powerful political force. The first third national party, quote unquote, in the United States was the anti-Masonic party. I mean, you could look how well, how narrowly defined <laughs> it was, you know, it was not like a, a libertarian party, you know, or a green party. It was like an anti-Masonic party. You create a party, a national party against something. The anti-Masons lost their presidential bid in 1832 to Andrew Jackson, a Democrat and a Freemason, but the damage had been done. Small-town preachers poured down condemnation on the Masons in their congregations, labeling them blasphemers, atheists, and expelled those who refused to quit the fraternity. New England school teachers shut their classroom doors to the children of Freemasons. A group of wives and mothers even issued dark warnings about unnatural acts committed inside the all-male Masonic lodges. In some places, it just devastates Freemasonry. The Vermont Grand Lodge simply closes up. They decide they can't continue to meet. The Michigan Grand Lodge has the same experience. In New York, in New England, Freemasonry was virtually destroyed. Uh, in Maryland, where my membership is, I believe we lost half our lodges. The Freemasons might have disappeared from America in the wake of what was known as the Morgan Affair. But the Freemasons would rise again propelled by a mysterious, charismatic leader who would transform the fraternity and lead to charges that the Freemasons were secretly in league with the devil. The Freemasons' rise in America took a staggering blow with the kidnapping and disappearance of William Morgan in the 1820s. Over the next 20 years, the Freemasons reinvented themselves as a large but low-profile charitable organization. Masons no longer boast about how powerful they are. They no longer talk about how God created their fraternity. So masonry comes back, and by the 1860s, it is beginning to grow again in dramatic scale. No one was more responsible for the Freemasons' growth in the 19th century than the controversial figure of Albert Pike. His work would transform the Freemasons and provide the fuel for every Freemason conspiracy theory to come. Pike made a tremendous contribution to Freemasonry, but also 
Albert Pike as a person is one of the most controversial, you know, Freemasons. Pike's work would bring charges of racism, Satanism, and charges that a hidden cabal of leaders inside the society secretly directed a Freemason conspiracy to rule America. He was 300 pounds, he was over six feet tall, and he looked for all the world like Merlin the Magician. He was a Renaissance man in his knowledge and interests. Uh, one of the main things that he accomplished was rewriting the rituals. The rituals, uh, those allegorical stories that teach the ethical and moral lessons. He wrote this incredible volume, Morals and Dogma, and he just went to town with all of the lure of uh, ancient uh, religion, philosophy, and um, uh, esoteric things of all kinds. He might mention druids or agnostics or whatever, as well as very Christian themes, very classical themes. Pike combined ancient religions, astrology, myths, and legends to create an elaborate new set of 33 Masonic initiations. The conspiracy theories claim that these 33 strange ceremonies and degrees hold the key to understanding the truth about the Freemasons. It's a philosophical system which teaches moral instruction. We have the Lodge of Perfection, which is the first 14 degrees, the Chapter of Rose Croy, the Council of Kadosh, and a consistory of Masters of the Royal Secret. Conspiracy theorists charge that these higher degrees are taught the true nature of the Freemason conspiracy, and that this truth is hidden from ordinary Masons. They point to Pike's own words, which seem to teach the art of deception. The first three degrees are but the outer court of the temple. Part of the symbols are displayed there to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretations. Their true explication is reserved for the adepts, the princes of masonry. The notion that the higher degrees conceal information from the lower degrees is actually taken out of context. The statement occurs in Morals and Dogma uh, in the chapter on the Knight's Kadosh, which is the ritual that reenacts the Knight Templar legend. The Knight's Templar were the medieval monks that fought in the Crusades that were destroyed by Pope Clement V and King Philip the Fair of France. Now, Pike taught that that degree should warn us about the abuses of power. He saw Pope Clement V and Philip the Fair as potential dangers to mankind and believed the early Masons veiled the meaning in allegories in the lower degrees to keep their ceremonies secret. Pike, who had been a Confederate Brigadier General in the Civil War, is also the source of another Freemason mystery, the question of his supposed relationship with the Ku Klux Klan. I've read that he supposedly wrote the rituals of the KKK. This is simply not true. I've looked through our entire collection of manuscripts of original writings by Pike, his personal correspondence from the period of the Civil War on up to the time that he died. There's not a single reference to the KKK. There's no evidence that Pike was ever a member, much less that he wrote the rituals. In an 1868 newspaper editorial, Pike did write that nothing much would come of the Klan, as it was poorly organized. He argued instead for a different secret society. We would unite every white man in the South, he wrote, who is opposed to Negro suffrage into one great order of Southern Brotherhood, whose very existence should be concealed from all but its members. It's a bit like Thomas Jefferson. You know, it's, there are sometimes contradictions that you cannot reconcile. I mean, he's a great founding father, you know, main drafter of the Declaration of Independence, yes, yet he's, his attitude towards slavery, you know, and what he did privately. I mean, how can you have these two people be the same? What well, they are. They are, and I guess we're human beings. Pike's Freemason elite is the 33rd degree, called the Inspectors General. To this day, this invitation-only group governs the Freemasons in Pike's southern jurisdiction. 33rd degree Masons have included President Harry Truman, General Douglas MacArthur, and the once powerful and feared FBI director J. Edgar Hoover. Every one of them, charged the conspiracy theories, manipulated events to help maintain control of America. The lack of evidence only seems to encourage the true believers. They accuse Freemasons of doing wicked, terrible things, 
Um, and when you tell them that it just doesn't happen, they, they just simply say, well, you don't know yet, you're not high enough. Well, I know plenty of extremely senior uh, Freemasons, grandmasters of running countries, and I know exactly what they know, because they ask me for advice on certain things. Um, and there is no higher level. Um, it just doesn't exist. The ultimate charge against the Freemasons is that they worship the devil. The accusation seems to stem from a single paragraph in Pike's 861-page book, Morals and Dogma. Lucifer, the son of the morning, is it he who bears the light and with its splendors intolerable blinds, feeble, sensual, or selfish souls? Doubt it not. The morning star is the planet Venus. In Latin, it's called Lucifer, which means literally light bearer, because it rises just before the sun comes. And so it, it, it is the bringer of the light. And what he meant is that it heralds the dawn and brings light to mankind. And unfortunately, in other contexts, Lucifer is Satan, and away you go with that. And so he appeared to be praising and lauding Satan which was never his meaning, and you know, it would be very wrong to take it that way. The Lucifer myth was exploited by a French author, pen name Leo Taxel, who wrote a wildly popular series of pamphlets and books denouncing masonry in the 1890s. But in 1897, Taxel proudly revealed that his depiction of Albert Pike as a Satanist was a complete and utter hoax. But for the Freemasons, the genie was out of the bottle. If you see the word Lucifer in Pike's book, and Taxel has told you that he's the sovereign pontiff of Lucifer, well, it, it all comes together. Those, those poor Masons, they're misled by the evil inner circle. And to the present, people have breathlessly told their friends, do you realize what the Masons are doing? And I suspect these are the same people that, that send an email and say, did you hear about the poor woman who dried her poodle in a microwave? Modern-day zealots even see signs of Taxel's devil in the layout of the streets of Washington, D.C. In the layout of Washington, you will find an image of an inverted five-pointed star. You're going to see two of the points sticking up, and away you go. You've got now a satanic image, and they believe that it was written into the design of Washington. <laughs> Very few rational people may truly believe the devil's face is embedded in the streets of Washington. But no Freemason mystery is more widespread than the rumors that swirl around the great seal of the United States and the strange symbols that appear on the $1 bill. By the 20th century, the Freemasons were deeply ingrained in American life. Their House of the Temple, completed in 1915, stands exactly 13 blocks from the White House. High above the 33 entrance steps, one for each Freemason degree, stands an unfinished 13-step pyramid, exactly the same design that appears on the back of the United States $1 bill. For generations, Americans have wondered about the possibility of a secret Freemason code hidden on the dollar bill. People will tell you that it was put there by the Freemasons, that there are secret words and anagrams, that if you draw a hexagram around the Great Seal, the letters that it connects are M-A-S-O-N, that 1776 is the year that the Illuminati of Bavaria was formed, that our all-seeing eye and unfinished pyramid are all there as our way of telling the world that we are in charge. Hogwash. The symbols on the dollar bill are derived from the great seal of the United States. The familiar American bald eagle appears on the front. The reverse features the mysterious pyramid and an all-seeing eye. The true story of the great seal begins with a committee formed the same day the Declaration of Independence was signed, July 4, 1776. It was designed by four separate committees over six years. Only one Freemason served on any of the committees, and that was Benjamin Franklin. Franklin served on the first committee, and he proposed as a design Moses standing on the banks of the Red Sea, parting the waters, while in the foreground were the children of Israel, and in the background were Pharaoh and his hosts. 
The final design was approved by Congress in 1782. George Washington, Ben Franklin, and other founding fathers were all Freemasons. Every symbol on the Great Seal would share both their Freemason heritage and their dreams for the new nation. Beginning with the incomplete pyramid, a symbol for both the Freemasons and their founding fathers. The pyramid is not unique to Mason, but Masons give it a great significance. You see, Masons are builders. So we're talking here about the American experiment. It's a building process. The fact that it's uncompleted, and this is the explanation that's given by the, the State Department and the SEAL, means that we have not completed and perfected our nation yet. We're still working on it, and we certainly are. The pyramid is a familiar symbol. The eye emanating light is not. Possibly derived from the Egyptian god's eye, by the Renaissance, the eye had become a common symbol for the all-seeing eye of the Christian god, watching over all of creation. The Freemasons would adopt the all-seeing eye, but not until 14 years after it first appeared on the Great Seal. For the Founding Fathers, the all-seeing eye was a way of acknowledging God without any reference to a specific church. They have an all-seeing eye to suggest the notion that somehow, without a specific Christian God concept, someone some being, some presence is overlooking the world. In masonry, the concept is very simple. To defeat ignorance, to defeat tyranny, to defeat fanaticism, the three eternal enemies of the free mind, of the free mason, you need to seek light. You need to become an enlightened citizen. No part of the Great Seal is more controversial than the Latin phrase novus ordo seclorum. The designer, Charles Thompson, a non-Mason, borrowed the words from a 2,000-year-old Latin poem. Translated, the phrase reads, New Order of the Ages, a reference to the dawn of the American era. The words have no direct connection to Freemasonry at all. The idea of a new social order, which is what I think the Novo Order Seclorum means, is the idea that we are building a new society in uh, the early United States. Talking about here building a new experiment, building a new republic, building a new order that is different from the old order, which was represented by an absolutist monarchy in an absolutist church. And one of the ways that I think it's mistranslated is new secular order, with the emphasis being on rooting out uh, religion. So people who look at this and see these conspiracy theories that are missing the point, really, of the history of the American Revolution and its ideals. The Founding Fathers' ideals are embodied in Washington, D.C., the city they built as a tribute to democracy. A new theory, first published by a French author in 1979, claims that the Freemasons among the Founding Fathers also built a secret code into Washington, making the entire city one vast pagan altar, a tribute to a goddess. The theory begins with the so-called Federal Triangle, the Washington Monument, the Capitol Building, and the White House. The significance, says the theory, can be found in the stars above. Every year between August 10th and 15th, just after sunset, three bright stars align directly over the Federal Triangle. You'll be looking at these three stars, Arcturus, Regulus, and Spica. Arcturus appears above the Washington Monument. Regulus above the White House, and Spica above the Capitol. In the triangle, hovering over the city's most important buildings shines the constellation Virgo, the Virgin Goddess. This strange annual alignment might be a coincidence, or it might have been deliberately created by Freemasons like George Washington, practicing a strange and ancient religion. And from this comes this theory that the entire city of Washington was oriented toward the Virgo symbol in the sky, which would be the Virgin. 
which if you trace it back can be Christian in nature, which would be the Virgin Mary. But if you trace it back far enough, you get right back to the Greek goddess Minerva or Isis, the Egyptian goddess. The idea of orienting your city to a goddess would be to seek to get the divine benevolence from that goddess. It seems an absurd theory on the surface, but there is this enigmatic portrait of the first Freemason, President George Washington. Washington's son holds the central Freemason symbol of the compass. Washington, his wife, and his daughter clearly indicate three specific points on a map of Washington, D.C. A triangle, location unknown. Freemason leader Albert Pike did call for a painting of constellations featuring Virgo to be placed on the ceiling of every Freemason lodge. And 19th century Masons did often reproduce images of Virgo tended by a master Mason sometimes under her zodiac sign. In fact, the zodiac sign of Virgo appears repeatedly in Washington. The district has a total of 53 zodiacs, more than any other capital city in the world, including this image of Virgo rising on the statue of James Garfield, president and Freemason. As with so many Freemason mysteries, the truth about Virgo may never be known with 100% certainty. And while the Freemasons have embodied the cherished American values of independence, equality, and brotherhood since the first days of the Revolution, their long history of keeping secrets means that the Freemasons will never be entirely above suspicion. Having studied Freemasonry for so long, it's it seems very strange to me that people still see masonry as being something which has this extraordinarily wide-ranging impact on society and in a very bad kind of way. As a non-mason, as a scholar, I would have liked nothing more than to find some major Masonic conspiracy. And unfortunately for my fame, the idea that there's a secret Masonic conspiracy just doesn't seem to hold up. The debate about who the Freemasons really are and what their impact has been on society here in America will most certainly continue. The myths, the rituals, and the secrecy that surround the Freemasons all act to keep the mysteries unsolved and the conspiracy theories alive.